It was December 7, 1941, over the Hawaiian island of Oahu, and the civilian pilot instructor was up in the air with their regular student when they saw a warplane coming their direction. It was coming at them so fast that the instructor had to take control of the plane from the student and open the throttle in order to avoid a head-on collision. The plane went underneath them so close that the instructor said the celluloid windows were rattling violently. The instructor managed to safely land the plane, but two other civilian instructors who went up that day, not knowing that they were flying into a war, never returned. Like so many after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, that instructor wanted to join the military and get their revenge. They wrote in a magazine article in June of 1943, each of us had some individual score to settle against the Japs who had brought death and destruction to our islands. But that pilot instructor, Cornelia Fort, could not easily join the military to get her revenge because at the time the U.S. military did not accept women pilots. When she got her chance, she jumped at it. She said, I knew that I was going to join the Women Auxiliary Flying Squadron before the organization was reality, before it had a name, before it was anything more than a radical idea. Cornelia Clark Fort was one of more than a thousand women who joined an organization that would eventually be known as the Women Air Force Service Pilots, the WASP, and their service deserves to be remembered. Bessie Lee Pittman was born in Florida in 1936, the youngest of five children. She married at just the age of 13. The marriage broke up after the death of their son at age 5, but she kept her married name, went by the name Jacqueline Cochran. She had a strong personal drive, which might be part of the reason that she tried to distance herself from her humble roots. She became a hairdresser in New York and started to develop her own line of cosmetics. There she met a wealthy industrialist, Floyd Odlum, who bankrolled her cosmetic business. But Jackie Cochran had another interest. In 1932, a friend offered her a ride in an aircraft, and she was hooked. She took flight lessons, became a qualified pilot. She and Oldlam married in 1935 and used her flying skills to help market her cosmetics under the title Wings to Beauty. She entered flying competitions, became friends with many of the famous aviators of the day, including Amelia Earhart. By 1939, she was one of the most famous women pilots in America. Knowing the U.S. was already building up its forces in anticipation of war, she approached Eleanor Roosevelt to suggest the possibility of using women as ferry pilots in wartime. Her idea was initially refused by the U.S. Army Air Corps. She went to England and served with the British Air Transport Auxiliary, which took women pilots for ferrying duties, and helped recruit experienced American female pilots to fly for the ATA. Born on Valentine's Day, 1914, Nancy Harkness took an interest in aviation at a young age, taking her first flight at age 16, and earning her private pilot's license the same year. In school, she was once suspended for buzzing the nearby boys' school in her plane. At the age of 18, she earned her commercial license. She married Robert M. Love, an Air Corps Reserve Major, in 1936. They built a successful aviation company. She competed in national air races and became a test pilot for the Gwynn Air Car Company, where she helped to develop the tricycle landing system. She first approached the Army Air Corps with the idea of using women pilots to ferry aircraft in 1940, suggesting that women pilots be made part of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, or the WACs. But there were technical issues with the suggestion, and as with Cochrane's suggestion, the time may simply not have been ripe yet. As Chief of the Air Force, General Hap Arnold was quoted as saying, the use of women pilots serves no military purpose in a country which has adequate manpower at this time. But after the outbreak of war, it became clear that qualified women pilots could play a valuable role flying aircraft in non-combat duties, freeing male pilots for combat. Both Cochran and Love submitted proposals. Cochran became head of the Women's Flying Training Detachment, or WFTD, to train women pilots, while Love recruited already qualified pilots into the Women Auxiliary Fearing Squadron, or WAFS. Among her first recruits was Cornelia Fort, she noted. We have no hopes of replacing men pilots, but we can each release a man to combat, to faster ships, to overseas work. Delivering a trainer to Texas can be as important as delivering a bomber to Africa, if you take the long view. The military seemed to agree, but only up to a point. The WASP were not soldiers. They were not officers like many who flew with the Air Transport Command. They were civilian contractors. Efforts to militarize the WASP faced not just procedural issues, but also opposition from members of Congress and the press who thought the idea of training women pilots to be a waste of resources. And while the WASP did the exact same duty as men who also served as civilian ferry pilots, the WASP were paid at two-thirds the rate of their male counterparts. 
the point was made dreadfully clear on March 7, 1943. Margie Sanford Oldenburg had become a flying enthusiast after meeting Amelia Earhart. She had graduated from the University of California and married a Marine ensign. According to the Oakland Tribune on February 7, 1943, she already had flight instruction at local airports and advanced training in Nevada when she left to become Berkeley's first representative to the Women Auxiliary Ferry Squadron. She went for training with Jackie Cochran's WFTD in Texas. On March 7th, she was training with a male instructor pilot, Norris Morgan, when their Fairchild PT-19 trainer failed to recover from a spin during spin training. She was the first trainee fatality in the program. As she wasn't officially in the military, she wasn't entitled to a military funeral. Jackie Cochran paid for her funeral out of her pocket. It was a stark reminder that the air service was dangerous, even to those who did not serve in combat. And a second reminder came just two weeks later. On March 21st, Cornelia Fort was ferrying Volte BT-13 Valiant trainers to Dallas Love Field, along with six newly trained male pilots. One of the other pilots clipped her left wing with his landing gear, tailing off the wingtip and six feet of its leading edge. The plane hit the ground vertically so hard that the engine was buried two feet into the ground. The pilot who had survived the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was the first woman pilot to die on war duty in American history. She was just 25 years old. Shortly before her death, she had sent a letter to the magazine, The Woman's Home Companion, detailing her experience at Pearl Harbor and her reason for joining the WAFs. The letter was published that June. The editor wrote, Her words here will live as moving account of why one woman joined the WAFs and as a testament to all American women who are helping to keep America free. In August 1943, the WFTD and the WAFS were combined to form the Women Air Force Service Pilots, the WASP. The training was difficult. More than 25,000 women applied for the WASP, but only 1,830 were accepted into the program. Of those, only 1,074 earned their coveted silver wings. For men, it would be tough. It's tough for girls, too. Among the first set of pilots was Catherine Rawls Thompson, who was an Olympic silver medalist in diving and had once been one of the world's top swimmers. Having qualified as a pilot when the 1940 Olympics were canceled due to the war, she decided to join the WASP. A WASP graduated with a commercial pilot's license and an instrument rating. They passed Army Air Force regulations and had the equivalent of a college aeronautical degree. They received essentially the same training as male Army Air Corps pilots. By graduation, WASP recruits had 560 hours of ground school and 210 hours of flight training. The WASP played a significant role in ferrying aircraft for the Air Transport Service. Over the course of the program, WASP logged 60 million miles and delivered 12,650 aircraft representing 78 different types to bases throughout the nation. Evelyn Sharp, who went by the nickname Sharpie, had grown up in Nebraska. She had made her first solo flight at just age 15, was one of the nation's first female airmail pilots, and had trained more than 350 pilots before becoming one of the first 23 women to join the WAFs, a group known as the Originals. By 1944, she was one of the most experienced of the WASP, a squadron commander who had ferried over 150 different planes of 18 different types. On April 3rd, she was ferrying a P-38 Lightning. Just one minute after takeoff, one of the plane's two engines failed. For many pilots, the remaining engine would have torqued the plane over and into the ground, but Evelyn jammed the rudder to counter the effect and turned the plane back towards the field. She pancaked the P-38 for a wheels-up landing. The plane was not badly damaged, but Evelyn's neck was broken. She was 24 years old. The airport at Ord, Nebraska is called Sharp Field in her memory. The WASP flew every type of mission any Air Force male pilot flew during World War II except combat. They took the duty many male pilots refused, serving as test and drone pilots and instrument and link instructors. They flew tracking and search-like missions, towed gliders and targets, and delivered weapons, cargo, and personnel. It is ironic that women who were prevented from flying in combat, ostensibly to protect them, were often given dangerous tasks that male pilots were afraid to fly. Towing targets was especially dangerous, and their planes were often hit by fire. Several wasps received wounds. The planes used for towing were often poorly equipped and maintained. At Camp Davis in North Carolina, there were 14 accidents involving improperly maintained towing planes, resulting in the death of two wasps. In June 1944, the bill to give the wasp military status failed in Congress by 19 votes. By that time, the nation had gone from a pilot shortage to having more volunteers than they could train. Pilot training commissioning schools were being reduced, and some males seeking to become pilots complained that training women was preventing the training of more combat pilots. Arnold had pressed Congress to either commission the women or disband the program. 
Congress chose the latter. In June, the House Committee on Civil Service reported that the program had become unnecessary. The program was officially disbanded December 20th, 1944. Some women from the program offered to continue to ferry planes for essentially no pay, but were still refused. Despite their contribution, the WASP were not well known at the time or for many years thereafter. Like many military programs, the records of the WASP were classified and sealed for 35 years, and their contributions and lives are just now being discovered by historians. While the WASP were experienced pilots, many of them had difficulty finding a employment in aviation at the time. Civilian airlines didn't hire female pilots. They said that public opinion wouldn't allow it. In 1949, the Air Force offered commissions to the WASP, but those that accepted were put in administrative roles. They weren't allowed to be pilots. The U.S. military didn't start accepting women pilots until 1974, and then the first one wasn't even with the Air Force. It was an Army helicopter pilot. The Air Force did not start accepting women into pilot training until 1976, and they weren't accepted into fighter pilot training until 1993. In 1948, Nancy Harkness Love was made a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force Reserve. She worked tirelessly seeking recognition for the WASP. She passed away due to cancer in 1976 at the age of 62. In 1953, Jackie Cochran piloted a Canadair Sabre borrowed from the Royal Canadian Air Force to become the first woman pilot to pilot a supersonic aircraft. She set numerous records and firsts for women pilots. She passed away in 1980 at the age of 74. In 1979, congressional legislation was finalized, so veteran status and military recognition and benefits were granted to the WASP. In 2009, President Barack Obama and the United States Congress awarded the WASP the Congressional Gold Medal. The Commemorative Air Force, an organization that was founded to acquire, restore, and preserve in flying condition a complete collection of combat aircraft, which were flown by all military services of the United States and selected aircraft of other nations, for the education and enjoyment of present and future generations of Americans, had restored an AT-6A aircraft that was used to train WASP. The CAF tours the nation with the plane as part of their CAF Rise Above WASP program. The program's mission is to share the story of the women Air Force service pilots in order to inspire others, especially girls and young women, to rise above expectations and find a greater appreciation of their potential. In addition to serving vital wartime functions and freeing more than a thousand pilots for combat duty, the WASP has served to inspire generations of women to careers in aviation. On December 7, 1944, General Arnold spoke to the last WASP class to graduate. He said, You and more than 900 of your sisters have proven that you can fly wingtip to wingtip with your brothers. If ever there was doubt that women can become skillful pilots, the WASP have dispelled that doubt.